to do. Yeah. Dun, dun. All right, can you see that? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <clears throat> Let me just. Bah, 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 bah. Push you down. I don't see you. I have entirely too many tabs open this morning. It's not even 7 a.m. I've only been at my computer for 20 minutes and I have way too many tabs open. Um, awesome. I'm excited to be here, y'all. And I know you're, you're starting this program virtual. Uh, you've got, uh, you've had some, you know, conversations with Gabe and Lisa already. And as I was kind of explaining early, I talk fast, I get super excited and it's really easy for me to just go. And right now, right now knows firsthand, uh, being in the office with me every day, how fast I can go. What well, reason why I say that is we have the next hour and change here. And we're gonna sit that sit down together tomorrow. Right. This stuff is dense, right? We're gonna talk about understanding your competitors, developing market personas. High level, it's easy, but some of it's dense. There's gonna be a lot of words on the screen. Don't try to read everything. There's gonna be a recording. You can see these slides later. Um the more important thing is, is to kind of pay attention and listen to me. If at any time you are like, Rob, I don't know what this word means. I don't understand what you said. That confuses me, please. There's a chat function here, right? Drop it in the chat, raise your hand, or even just, you know, right now you can interrupt me and like pause me. Um, I'll kind of have you be the one to kind of paying attention for any of the, uh, um, anything like that, all right? I'll kind of have you just help me manage any questions. Or if you feel like, hey, Rob, people are not understanding, just jump in, all right? Um, so today we're gonna talk about competitor analysis, right? Why is this important? A couple of reasons. It's important for positioning and your messaging, right? The reason why we had you do a quick intro right there is your messaging is extremely important especially if you're looking to come to a new market right as you look to scale out in different markets your messaging might change based on what you're trying to say the language and what the market needs number two is the most important part understanding your competitors one of the biggest things that we see as people come into the market, they show us a competitor analysis slide. And it's like, we have no competitors. We are new and innovative. I tell you that's bullshit, right? Especially in the US market, right? So you need to understand there's a lot of competitors, understand them and learn from them. They've already, if they've done something well, it's great to learn from them. Then understanding your business market persona, right? What is a market persona? How do we leverage that? And then we'll get into some Q&A today. Why is this important? Well, because you understand your competitors in the market, right? You need to perform a thoughtful and detailed analysis of the market. Sorry, I have tons of book resources I'm gonna share with you throughout the workshop. Um, you need to understand really what the landscape is, and not just the refined version, you know, really build a strong roadmap, right? So you want to understand all these things on the page. And, and it's, again, it's dense. And I'm not going to just read through a bunch of blocks on the slide, but you can read these later. The thing that you really want to know is, do you know, right, as we go through this, do you know who you're selling to and why, right? What this whole thing that we're going to talk about today breaks down to is do you know who you're selling to and why? So we're going to start with understanding our competitors. Uh, I don't know if you know, Philip Kotler has wrote a ton of books on marketing. Poor companies ignore their competitors. Average companies copy their competitors. Winning companies lead their competitors, right? 
when you enter a new market, you definitely want to copy your competitors and figure out how to lead them forward. So what we tend to see is your companies here. You have some target market pain points. And then you go try to get user clients, right? You want to solve these pain points. And this is what most of us do, right? When I talked about like, hey, we have no competitors. We're cool and awesome. But you do a complete evaluation. This is what your, your competitor analysis should look like, All right? It should be detailed. You should know who solves what pains alongside you. You should know if there's things they're solving that you're not. And you should know what you're solving that no one else is. If all of the pains that you're solving is taken on by somebody else, cool, that's not a bad thing. You need to understand what makes you different in that regards. So when companies do this, they tend to come in and get smacked in the mouth in a new market. When companies do this, they come in and tend to have success. That's, right now, can you mute that mute? There we go, thank you. So we wanna make sure we do a complete competitor evaluation. Look in the mirror, understand who it is. Our evaluation process, how do we do this? Well, first we identify and we categorize, right? Then we get that baseline information. We identify strengths and weaknesses. Then we really think about what is our differentiators? And what's even important here is what are your, what are your competitors' differentiators? How do your competitors differ from you? And then you assess the competitive strategy and landscape. Start by using Google search, right? There's tons of resources out there. Uh, I know that for y'all, unless you have a VPN, LinkedIn is hard to get, but LinkedIn is an amazing place. Other tools like Crunchbase, Owler are great tools to identify and categorize to get the website name, business focus areas, et cetera. This is what we call identify. This is how we identify and categorize, right? You're going to do company name, website, business focus areas. Then you're going to get that baseline information. So where they operate, location, how many employees they have, uh, maybe some of their website marketing messaging. Why is this important? Well, if their website's getting a lot of traffic, you might want to emulate it. Product service offerings, news and press releases. Find out what, what's being said about them across the world or across the ether. And then any business reviews. Then we set that strength and weaknesses analysis, right? Think about your competitors side by side, right? What are we aiming to build? What are they doing well? What do you think they're lacking in? Are there anything, any other product offerings besides what you're building? And are there things that you think you could do better? Differentiation. Any differences in product or service offerings? Clients, customer bases, social media presence. Do they have one and you don't? Do you have one and they don't? Right? Relationships, pricing, business focus. And then our kind of assessing competitive strategy. This is where you start thinking about features, services, again, pricing, market positioning, messaging strategy, and market approach. Right? This is what it might look like all together. Right? A very detailed spreadsheet. Why is this all really important? Why, why, why would we go through all these steps, right? Why do we want this view to look like this? Because this is how we develop our go-to-market plan, right? Once you understand this, you can understand how to go into a market. It's really easy for us to get lost in the sauce of our own companies. We're doing this, we're gonna do this, here's how we're gonna do it. The US market's so big. You need to really understand what the market is. Has anybody heard of this book before? It's called Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. I'm gonna put this in the chat. Has anybody heard it before? You know, to be honest, no. No, okay. No. So 
steal like an artist. If there is one book that I always recommend any founder that's looking to come into a new market is this one. Okay. So what this book is about, it's 10 things no one told you about being creative and it's the New York Times bestseller. It's really easy. It's like lots of pictures and very few words. But the idea behind this book is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? When you're doing a competitor analysis, something that you can do is that you can learn from them and you can actually take what they are doing in a way that makes sense for your business, internalize it and utilize that within your business. Again, it's called steal like an artist for a reason. Nothing in this world is really original. Everything is influenced by something. We've heard it before, we've seen it before. Something influences it. Steal like an artist is just a great little handbook of how to do that from a business perspective. It doesn't come off like, that you're stealing in a bad way, right? It comes off of how do you take things and internalize it? And when you do a competitive analysis like this, if I know that there's six other competitors in my market doing a similar training company or a web app company, and they have say a hundred users and I don't, how do they go get a hundred users? How can I leverage some of the lessons that they've learned so they'll get 200 users in the time that they got 100? This is why competitive analysis is so important. When you put this together, you truly understand what you're up against and you can leverage that to be a better version of yourself. So this is what it would look like all together in, in kind of graph form, right? You can kind of see high tech, you know, we have the, the boundary lines of high tech to low tech. Um, everyday people to, you know, your mega stores from a media standpoint. Um, you can see kind of influencer there on the left, all the way with maker on the right. So you can kind of see what's a high tech and sorry, mega stars. So, you know, those that are 1 million plus followers versus an influencer, which is for like all of us that have, you know, a couple hundred followers, right? And what tools and, and things that we can do and where they follow. And so you can kind of group them. And then you can kind of understand those as the lay of the land and see if there's anything that kind of carries over. So if I'm looking to do a new influencer marketing tech platform and I want it to be kind of that mid-market, I know that I'm going to have to compete against FameBit, Radio, Influential, Isaiah, Full Mascar Media. And so I might be looking at them. I'm not going to be trying to compare myself to influencer. Influencer's not a target market company. And I'm not wanting to compare myself to maker. It's too far outside. So I know where my sweet spot is and who I need to be looking at and who I'm competing with and really understanding what I need to do to get, to get there. All right. Another way to do this is kind of a graph it out of, you know, what you do better than your others. You know, this is where you can kind of see, okay, data management, algorithms, all these different you know, parameters and see what you do better and kind of looking at that. Great way to visualize what you do versus what they don't. You have to be really, really honest here with yourself of what you offer and what you don't. Not, oh, I could offer this, so I'm gonna check that box, which is what many times we do. So make sure you're clear with that. Questions so far? We, we tracking and following? You feel like yes, we're understanding guys, what I'm talking about? Uh, yesterday, you guys have a question to me about the difference between different columns on this table. So you could ask uh, this question to Rob as well. So maybe he will be able to help you with that. Alexander, you had the question yesterday, right? Because I remember. Mm. Yes, I had a question uh, yesterday, but now it's... Uh... Okay. It's quite clear because we discussed it uh, yesterday. I could be wrong. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, I, I, I can. Uh, yeah, why don't you ask the question again? We can just talk through it. It's always good yes. to 
Uh, double check yes, it. Um, everyone else might have the same question. Wait just a afraid second. To ask. I, I share your screen. Oh, uh, I don't have permission to share my screen. Could you? Because uh, it's sharing by uh, Rob. There. Oh, yes. Can you know? Uh, do you see it? I yes. do, yep. Uh, yes. Um, I had a question about uh, this uh, three cones. What is the company's main focus? What are the major product attributes and competitors' USP? How they yeah. separate themselves? Uh, they are quite uh, equal. And... Um, yes and no. So also right now, I love that Dave does this because this is so highly in line from like my ICP sales workshop uh, and USPs, right? So what this means here, Alexander, is your current market focus, website news, what we call positioning is so this is where things are a little bit different because while you put in what they do, right? From their website and from news online, how do they position themselves? I.e., uh, are they positioning themselves? We are a creative tool for individual content creators to make your photos better. Are we, you know, are they uh, a tool using technology to help companies? create detailed images for content at scale, right? They're put you, from their website and from the news, you should understand how they position. So let's look at your, for example, you say you, you help make images better, right? So who are you targeting? What is your position? Are you looking at enterprise clients or are you looking at direct consumer users? Mm -hmm. So this would be that positioning statement they have. And you can kind of see that because it like should tell you on their website of what their position at. The major product attributes, like what are their major, like what, what are the things that do really well? So you put just the products, SD, SDK, Builder, AR, Search 3D. Um, so that, or you think about the major product ad, attributes, like is it easy to use? So you put like easy AR builds, like that's a product attribute, right? It's easy to build, low cost, can turn around in 24 hours, um, those types of things. Um, like you hear, like the one you have SDK, search engine, Google map pointer, like those, those are like product attributes, but your product attributes would be around those type of things, right? Those are attributes of the product, not just what the product is. And then your key competitor differentiators is a USP is what we call a unique selling proposition, right? Every company should have one value proposition, right? Your value proposition is essentially the value you bring to the market. Then you should have three to five unique selling propositions. And these unique selling propositions change based on what pain you're solving and who your target customer is. Because you, you have a couple of different options here. So... What you want to understand here is like what they do better. So by putting an admission statement is okay, but their mission is not their unique design proposition. So what makes each company truly unique, right? So this might be, you put the most powerful platform for creation 3D AR. So their key competitor is that they have the largest library. Like a USP might be they have the largest library. They have the most powerful software. Um, they have the most options, whatever that kind of uniqueness is about them, put mm -hmm. those things there. So this is how you, so you're close, you're really close here. Uh, but this is where the three kind of line out, right? So what's that main focus? What are the things that make them unique? Like their product attributes, like differentiates them. And then that one kind of key uniqueness piece. Um, 
so they're close, but they're, they're, they're also different. Like you have to think of them from those three different hats. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, am I right that uh, uh, USB, it is a unique uh, feature of the company. Uh, it is that uh, other companies don't have at all. Yes. Yeah, so um, it can be. So the unique selling proposition is what a USB actually stands for. And it means what makes them unique to sell to you? Like, why are they sellable in the market? So for example, because I want to I want to kind of bum, 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 where is it good? Uh, 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 uh. Okay. This will work. Coffee mug. This coffee mug. Okay. okay. Coffee mug. This coffee mug. What is unique about this one? The one I'm raising up. What is what might be unique about this one over this one? Look at them side by side. What would say a unique selling proposition of this one is? Uh, so left is bigger and uh, has uh, designed with some people. Okay. The unique selling proposition is right. It's bigger. So this one being bigger means I can hold more liquid, less refills. That's a unique selling proposition. We make our coffee mug bigger so that you can have, hold more without having to refill as much. So those long nights at the office, you don't have to get up every 20 minutes for a new cup of coffee. So what would be a unique selling proposition about this one? It's smaller, let's, let's go back to it. Our mug is perfectly sized so that your coffee stays hot the whole time you're drinking it. It doesn't ever get cold because it's too big. So our mm -hmm. unique selling proposition is the perfect size. This unique selling proposition is it holds more liquid. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that help make an idea? Does that help give you like a visual representation of like a unique selling proposition? Now think about again, this is like coffee mugs versus like big technology. And you and I can sit down. Let's, you know, if you haven't already, let's schedule time. I would love to walk through this and talk about it because because where you're at is so close. And I think that you understand it conceptually. Now you need to like put it on paper of like, if I'm looking at other builders doing something similar, like what makes them unique over me? Really hard because you have to put your ego aside for that. Okay, now I understand. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah. clear. it's really clear. Okay, was, no. that, was, was that helpful for everyone else? Did everyone else get value out of that or have any further questions? Okay, all good. I'm taking silence is a is a good and, thing. Uh, what about battery boots? Uh, mm, could you uh, explain it again? Am I right? Is that this main features, uh, main instruments, maybe which uh, company use? Use oh, which which column? Uh, product attributes. Yeah. Uh, yeah so the main a, a product attribute for product attributes for this is. Um, you know, it's bigger, round, uh, design. So from a technology standpoint, a product attribute might be they use SDK and 3D modeling. Uh, they like, so product attribute is if they could turn around their photos in 24 hours or less, it's a product attribute. Their technology allows them to or if it's in minutes, right? If their technology allows you to clean up a photo in minutes, that's a product attribute. So it's not just the product itself and the tools they use, but how, like attributes of the product are things that that levels it. Like, right, like a pair of shoes, a product attribute is not only that it looks cool or whatever, but if it's a running shoe, has a different sole, like all those things are product attributes. So from your, you know, your platform, Look at look at it from that perspective. So like your attributes are, we do this, we do this, we do this, and from a customer perspective, you get this turned around in this much time. You can use it for these five different, you know, things, right? Like, can your product be used for general consumption? Can it be used for, you know, 
our product allows you to scale pictures from Instagram to, you know, WhatsApp to Telegram to Facebook to LinkedIn. Like we optimize all your pictures and resize them for your platforms using XYZ Builder. That's a product attribute. Okay. So uh, I want to say, let's, if, if you have more questions on that, let's table that for a one-to-one -one conversation um, and go deep into it. But you're close here. You're really close here. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, why don't you stop I sharing? And I'll, you stop sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll pull back up my deck. Uh, Back in here. Lost a deck. Huh. Sorry, one second. I lost my, it won't pull up the workshop. There we go. For some reason, it wasn't showing it as an option to share the screen. All right, we're good. Um, Alexander, great question. And hopefully that was helpful. I love doing this shit. Um, so, you know, I know set up some one-to-one -one, um, time on my calendars. I know Dave is like the normal guy that does it, but secretly I love doing this shit. This is my background. Um, I never gave you guys a quick background on me, so I'm going to use this time to do a quick intro on myself because I just like launched right in. Um, so I'll give you the quick two minutes. So my name is Rob Napoli. I have been a coach at Starda since 2018. Uh, so back before right now, back before Gabe, uh, when Nastia took over the program back in 2018, uh, is how long I've been with Starda. Uh, I've worked in sales and marketing my entire life. I have a master's in international multi-channel marketing from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, I did five years in recruitment, had a five and a half million dollar book of business in three years, met my now wife in small town, Iowa, which is in the middle of the United States. We moved to Italy together. I spent two years living in Milan, Italy, where I coached professional American football, got my master's degree, and I worked for a direct consumer startup. So, you know, the guys at Titanium, I worked for a D2C wearable device connected to an app velocity-based training company, helping you lift better. I scaled that globally. So to every country I could legally sell it into, I built the community, built the whole big content plan. We went from doing 5 million or sorry, 5,000 uh, MRR. So monthly recurring revenue to a hundred thousand monthly recurring revenue in less than six months. I came to the U.S. market. I went through a U.S. accelerator, helped them raise a million dollars. Unfortunately, I ended up not scaling in the U.S. market. Went back into recruiting, recruited for startups. Then and I got fired for the first time, launched my own two businesses. So I run a sales as a service for the U.S. market called Half Day Group, where we help companies do product market fit, product market testing, and running their top of funnel sales service uh, with a team out of Mexico. I run a company called Rise Up Training, Rise Up Coaching. It's a training development company where I do a lot of uh, work with startups, entrepreneurs, all the way through corporate, bringing millennial mindset into the boardroom. I work for 12 different global accelerators. In the last three years, I've worked with over 500 startups in either a one-to-one -one or small group capacity on scaling their businesses. So this is the shit I love to do. Um, I've been there, done that, gone through these programs, raised money. I've helped startups um, that I've worked with raise about 10 million, 10 to $15 million in pre-seed or seed funding. And I've had two companies that I've worked with that have gone on to raise ser series A and series B of over a hundred million dollars of funding. Um, so that's, that's my background. Uh, so I apologize for not getting that on the front end. Um, I was just so excited to get into the content and learn from you that I just jumped in because as Renee might have told you, uh, usually you saw the videos from a guy named Dave DiCorselle, who's my dude. 
Um, Dave and I work closely together on creating sales and marketing content for startup. I'm more from the sales side, he's from the marketing side, but secretly having a master's in marketing, I love the marketing side um, as well. So I was really excited to do this workshop with you all today. So uh, if you have LinkedIn, that is um, my LinkedIn stuff. If you don't have LinkedIn, you can go to my Beacons page and find my other socials and you can kind of learn a little bit more. All right, reset. Understanding your market personas. Gabe, we, uh, right now we have till eight or 8.30. Uh, we booked till 8.30, so yeah. Perfect, we got time. plenty of time. Yeah, well, we're almost done. So we have plenty of time for a and a which is what I love because um, Dave, is, Dave is like me. We do short decks and we don't overwhelm people with stuff because it's a lot. But I just want to make sure we have plenty of time for conversation. So we have understanding our business market persona, right? So our market or buyer persona, that's who's buying from us. So not everyone has their camera on. So if you can please put in the chat for me, are you selling B to C? Or are you selling B to B? Will you just put it in the chat for me, please? B to B or B to C? Okay. B to B, B to C. Excellent. I know we have more than two companies here, fellas. B to B to C. Okay. Ooh. So my B to B to C guy, I know you were you got on a little late. Can you quickly tell me what you do, your company? Uh, you were the one that was driving. Sergey, yeah, he was in a train. I mean, the train. train. Yeah. So yeah. if he, okay, we'll, we'll we'll talk with him later. Then I don't want to if he's still on the train. Um. So B to B to C, B to B, B to C. Okay. So we're split. We're we're split here. So the reason why I asked that question is selling B to B and selling B to B are a little bit different in the way you do your marketing and sales process. A lot of these things mm -hmm. are similar, but there's some very key differences that you have to think about from a channel perspective. Okay. So when you think about a market or buyer persona, you want to think about their age range, right? Um, and gender. And this is really more important for the B2C side. From a B2B standpoint, now it's really important because you got to think about our, you know, the companies, if you're selling into, if you're selling into financial enterprise, which none of you I think are, but if you're selling enterprise financial and you're selling at that VP level, you're going to probably stick a lot of older folks in the in the, that space, right? But if you're selling into, let's say, SMB mid-market tech companies, hip tech companies, you're going to get a lot more millennial managers. Why does that matter? Because the method of reaching out matters. Millennials don't want a phone call. They want text messages and video messages. And old school executives still might want to be picking up the phone and having a conversation with you. Right. So understanding your buyer persona and kind of what age range they fall in is going to be important on your outreach method methodology. Right. If I'm targeting Gen Z and a B to C play, uh, am I going to be on Facebook anymore? Probably not. I'm going to be on TikTok and Instagram. Right. <clears throat> so it's really important to understand what that age range is of your buyer. Technology, what technologies are they using? What software? What social media? What are their communication habits? Right? They want to be texted or they want to be called? Do they want to be video message or voice noted? So what are their motivations, right? Habits, goals, needs, rationale. What are their problems and pain points? You know, from a B2C standpoint, what does a day in the life look like? Right? You know, does your consumer, let's say, Millennials, let's say 28 to 40, they probably wake up, they probably immediately grab their phone, start checking it. Maybe they go and do yoga or meditation, and they're right back to the, the technology and like rocking and rolling, right? So we can understand what they do when they wake up. How do we connect with them? How do we catch them early? How do we catch them late? What are their pain points in their day? 
from the B2B standpoint, it's really important to understand their experience, their background, their job titles. What are they doing that? What are the challenges of that? So how do we assemble? How do we figure this out? Well, we do in-person market research. We interview people. We set up time to talk to real people and get to know what their things, what their interests are. You know, when you come to a new market, most people are like, I want to close the, my first deal in the first 30 days. And I'm like, hold the fuck on. When you go to a new market in your first 60 days, your goal should be 20 customer interviews. If you can get 20 customer discovery or customer interview calls in your first 60 days, that is a win. Because you need to ask them, what are they using? What do they do? How do they find you? What are they looking for? You need to do these in-person interviews, right? So conduct market research either before you come to a new market or right after you come. And you want to build a beta feedback group, right? So once you identify people who love or use your product service or in your advocacy group, which is great because when you use a program like Starta, you have natural advocates, advocates like uh, Renault, myself becomes an advocate, right? So I'm, I'm highly likely to give you great feedback and continual feedback, right? The startup community becomes your, your beta feedback group. Uh, but what you do is you have them testing your product and giving you feedback loops, right? And these are the ones that you really need to make sure that you have all those things tightened up. And then surveys, send out surveys. Creating a survey that is unbiased but strategic to give you the information you need could be also helpful filling in the gaps. And then you can also look for online demographic and trends. I mean, you're not the first one going into a market. Steal like an artist. See if somebody else has already done that, <laughs> that testing for you so you don't have to. Then once you assemble this, you can actually build out what we call our, our buyer persona, right? So you have a picture here of what that, that buyer might look like, you know, some personal information, right? So for this product, it might be a female, ages 25 to 40, college graduate, urbanite, right? So lives in a city. Uh, they're open to new experiences. They're intellectually curious, enjoys traveling and connecting, uh, has a set routine, uh, avid Pinterest user, avid social media user, loves like product sales and discounts, so a thrifty shopper. She gets very frustrated about shopping for furniture because she can rarely find the right place uh, that is going to fit the space for apartments, a right piece, sorry, right? So she's turned to online shopping and using sites like Wayfair and Amazon to avoid the hassle of shopping in the stores. Her goal is to need more online, need new furniture. And you have kind of a day in life, like she gets up at seven, she goes to work on the bus and subways, it's where she's checking social. Three, you know, nine to five is her work life. And then about six, she goes back home, watches Netflix, browses the internet, eight to ten, she works on her hobbies. This is all super important, right? Because now we can define here. We have goals, frustrations, motivations, what her day looks like. How can our business help Heather? Right. Well, we eliminate the hassle for online shopping by aggregating all online uh, deals and give her the best products and prices that fit her budget um, on her time on social. Like this is where we can talk about helping out and this stuff. Then the day in her life is like, okay, well, we know from nine to five, she's in work. She's not checking social. So I might be pushing out nudges and ad campaigns at between eight and nine and between seven and eight. Why would I want to run, you know, pay valuable money to run ad campaigns between nine to five, right? So every piece of this information becomes super valuable for you. Now from a B2B standpoint, very similar, right? This is our ICP. So our ideal customer persona. Remember when we're selling B2B, we have the person that we're helping person has the pain that we solve <clears throat> who is not always the decision maker sometimes they become champions so you have to understand who your champion is and who your decision maker is <clears throat> excuse me it means who writes the final check so here we're looking at you know male 35 to 40 mid senior exec works in the agency business uh loves to himself with people smarter than him intellectually curious um 
develops um, likes to develop communication uh, that leadership. He uses LinkedIn daily. He is a decision maker. He's tasked with you know pulling the trigger on things, analyzes uh, everything before making the decision. He's motivated by the opportunity to grow his business by any means. He's focused on growth and being the best executive. He wants to increase his business, his team, his frustrations are fear of losing business to competitors and losing, uh, you know, falling behind in the digital marketing space. And so here we put day in our life, we're going to put probably more objections, right? Understanding like, does my business fulfill my needs? Like what are things that could be red flags to overcome? And then how do you help Eric? <clears throat> So this gives you, now you have a very clear understanding of who you're selling to and why, right? So you want to build these kind of target client personas. And for many of you, it might be one or two or even three, right? Depending on what you're targeting. Right? So we want all this information <clears throat> is super, super important to us, right? It's as good as gold. If we know these things, then we can actually go create targeted messaging, ads, sales, outreach, all the good things that we can actually connect personally with our buyer and get them to want to buy from us, right? We want to use this to further develop, develop or refine our product service capabilities, right? Product road mapping. This is where we really can differentiate ourselves and show our true value. You want to build, uh, use it to build and refine marketing messaging, your website, right? <clears throat> you know, for those that are B2B and B2C, maybe you have two sides of the website that show B2B and B2C capabilities, right? We want to split that up so it's not confusing. All right. As a lot of information really quickly, we have tons of time uh, to answer questions but the, the last thing i want to say this is that you know to become a unicorn truly this slide information that's good as gold is really important right when we have information and the hard part is is we think you know we start products and services because we either have a pain ourselves or we see a pain we start building it the hard thing is we forget to, to continue to listen to our customers this whole thing here is to remind you to look at your competition and listen to your customers always. You need these continual feedback loops to validate yourself at every stage of the market, right? And that's why we put a lot of time, energy, and effort into talking about a competitive analysis and building our buyer personas. Because then you actually can build a strong plan to the market because once you start taking this to a sales perspective and targeting, you need to know this, otherwise you're gonna, your message is gonna fall on deaf ears and no one's gonna hear it. All right, <clears throat> Q&A, we got plenty of time to, to walk through this. What do you got? Questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? Did everyone understand? I mean, I'm sure there's some things that I was saying and showing that was confusing because not I, I know that not all of you have a perfect mastery of the English language. So please, you know, if you if there was something that was confusing to you, I'm sure that somebody else saw, thought it was confusing. So please use this time to ask in front of everybody so that we can make sure because this is tough stuff and it's a, it's a lot of work to do for your business, but it's going to put you in a much better place. Sergey, are you able to to tell us about your product? Maybe if you're no, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. So I'm gonna put a question in the chat. Um, is your challenge that, that you are dealing with? Rob, uh, could you share this uh, your presentation? Yes. If it's, it is possible. It is very possible. Okay, it's great. Okay. 
Uh, no, I, I mean, um, could you send us? Uh, oh, uh, send this? Yeah, I can send this to you right after. Um, or not, uh, Dave never sent it to you. Yeah, right you can. Time, right? You can put. You can send it to me. I put it to the Notion. To okay, cool. Notion. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to or not right after this, and there'll be a Notion um, within the hour. Yes, sure. So I put in the chat a question for y'all, and maybe. Maybe y'all are afraid to just like speak in English to me, but we'll want to type it out. But let's use this time here because I I know, you know, I'd love to think that y'all the smartest guys in the, the smartest people in the room, and everything I just shared hits. But I've done this too many times to know that it's a lot to take in, and many of you want to go back and watch the recording, look at the deck, spend plenty of time with it to to really understand. So I get that but we'd love to talk through if one of you want to actually go through what's a major challenge that you're dealing with right now and let's talk through it as a group because that's huge with where you are today would anybody want to volunteer and to walk me through a challenge that they're dealing with and get some real-time insights and workshop this in, in real time i see my guy smiling with yes. his face background <laughs> I, I know some of you are interested in this and, and, and maybe it's because we're on a group call I don't know but there's really nothing that you can bring up that's that should be embarrassing this this is tough stuff and growing a business is the hardest fucking thing you'll do and doing it in multiple languages is even harder like I know because I lived in Italy for two years so what can I help you with A Paul's question, I can answer. Mm. For us, uh, the major challenge uh, is find uh, the nearest step to become uh, of our future. Mm. I explain a little bit more. We have uh, some uh, picture of in our heads of our product of our company in the future and we see that it will be a prosperous company um, with some great idea of um, uh, of reality interfaces um, and now we challenging uh, to make step in to that future and uh, in the same time to make money right now. So, um, best way to, I mean, the best, I mean, the best way to answer this question is, is, is kind of a different parts, right? So like you build a company and, and just to make sure I understand you, you know, you have a vision of where the company is going and what you want to build and you want to continue building it, but there's the challenge of making money right now, right? So you have to build yes. a company, but you have to make money while you're building it, right? So, you know, there's an idiom in America that we say, building the plane while flying it. I don't know how that translates into Russian and if if that doesn't make sense since anyone wants to translate it. Um, you got but, it, you got it, I can just say it. <clears throat> you said don't, don't build a plane on a, on a, on a flight, right? No, no, no. It, it's an example. What we say is you're ah, building the ah, you're, you're, you're building, building the plane while flying, so like you're literally like taking off in an airplane that's pieced together with duct tape and glue, and you're like building the different parts of the landing gear, so that when you actually have to land the plane, you have it. We call it building while flying, and it means that you don't have you're never going to have all the answers. And when you're doing this process, right? There's there's you need to set up, and this is why you do a competitive analysis. This is why this stuff is really important. Is a okay, our competitive analysis is this where we are today, right? You have a minimal viable product, you have things that you can do, and maybe you don't have a minimal viable product, <clears throat> but what you do have is a set of skills that you can be a bit of a consultancy, right? This is how we're gonna make money to fund building this product. And you take that to market. And yes, you want to be bigger than that, but start where you are. And if where you are is in this space today, build in this box. But as you're building in this box, you're setting up 
bigger growth for success. So for example, if you want to sell in multiple markets at the enterprise level, but today you're selling and you want to sell like a product, like a SaaS product, but today you're selling consultancy with software, do the consultancy with software. But when you're building new products and features, make sure that you never build something that's going to block you later. Right. So, so you kind of have to make these decisions and it's not easy, but take what you can get early, but, and you use that to fund it. So there's no easy answer other than kind of looking at what can you do today? Do you have a, a product that's on the market that can be sold? If so, yes. And take that to market and sell it to who will buy it do a lot of customer feedback in that process and learn a lot so that you're getting the answers to the questions that you have the vision up here, right? Because your vision is to be bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. And understand that <clears throat> not every company is going to be a unicorn. 99% of companies have a lot longer runway than, than, you know, take a lot longer to get up to speed than you think, right? We see these big win companies like that, you know, do something really quickly, they flash in the pan, they get a ton of VC back money and they can scale. And that's very far and few in between. In fact, there was an article last night about Clubhouse. Clubhouse was the next big thing during the pandemic. It got tons of VC funding and now it's a shell of itself. It's, it's bleeding users, dubious advertising, and it's just full of drama rooms because they didn't do a great job curating the next level of iterations on it. And it was something that happened during a pandemic was a flash of hand, got a lot of VC money, but never scaled. In reality, most companies take four or five years to get their product market fit right. I mean, true product market fit, right? <clears throat> and then it takes them another three to four years to really grow. So... When I look at companies like, Rob, we're going to do $5 million in the next three years, I look at them and say, no, you're not, right? Your goal should be to, there's three, there's three main goals in your business. One, can you make it to year one, right? Can you get through year one growing your business? Doesn't mean you're profitable. It doesn't mean, it means can you make it to year one? Because you might have taken on debt. The next milestone is can you make it to year three? And if you can make it to year three, it means you've got some sort of reoccurring revenue and consistent process built out. You have customers, you have things growing. The final is can you make it to year five? You can make it to year five and be profitable and you can scale your business to wherever you want it to be, right? So start where you are. How do you get to year one? How do you get to the next year with the current product and services that you have today to make money and take that money and build the next level of the product? Then it's going to be year two. And you're going to ask yourself this question. How do I take everything I learned in year one, the updated product I have, and go to the next market? Then you're going to go to year three. How do I do the same thing all over again? right? This is the build while flying your plane. And this is the best way I can tell you to make money while taking your company to where it goes. Don't try to create your company to where you want it to go in your brand vision overnight. Success takes hard work. Step by step. Because when you do it step by step like that, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to have these feedback loops that at some point you're going to hit a flashpoint and you're going to scale so fast you don't even know what to do with yourself. But if you keep looking for that big home run swing, I know I'm using way too many idioms that are very American that might not be uh, understandable, but if you always try to take the big shot, you're setting yourself up for failure because those that build that continual plan and use competitive analysis to continue those feedback loops, you will continue, you will build a bigger, better company than you, than you can you realize, but you just got to stay the path. So use what you have at your disposal. If you have a good product, if you have a consultancy business, use it and take it, make money. Don't try to go where you want to go tomorrow, but put a plan in place.
there. Okay, thank you for advice. Yeah. What else? Great. Bet. Any other questions or thoughts? Uh, uh, we have a question, Rob. Yeah. Uh, Actually, we have uh, a little discussion here, uh, therefore we allow it. Um, in short, our app sells uh, customer relationship management system for B2B. Uh, but for that, uh, patients have to download our app application, mobile application. It turns out we get money from B2B, but the app, uh, our application is useful for B2C, um, uh, who should we focus on? B2B or B2C? So it's a great question. Uh, and it really depends on what you want to build, right? Because B2C is great. Oh, I'm going to tell you this, having worked in the space a little bit, you know, the ZocDocs of the world and all that, um, were really great for a while, but do you know what they all did eventually? They all went B2B because playing in the B2C space is tough, especially if you're trying to connect them with doctor's offices and things like that. It becomes a pain in the ass. Yes, your app could probably get downloaded more B2C early and get early traction. Stay B2B. Be B2B to C, right? Because when you go B2B and you white label or give, you know, doctors and hospitals and just in general, the medical field, while they are very innovative on, you know, what they do, they are very slow to adopt any new technology. Uh, that's just that they're they don't want to because it's just how they are. So you have an opportunity to create something that's going to help make their life easier. And for a doctor, saving them time is also making them money because they have less time doing charts in between patients. The more time they have to see more patients and make more money. And if you can white label your solution, et cetera, you can open up a lot of doors for a lot of things to happen. So I would stay B2B to B to C. That's just my personal opinion from what I know of the market on, you know, having a 30 second description from you, because having seen ZocDoc and some of these others go B2C C first, they all fell back and went B2B B eventually because B2C C is so hard to go from B2C to C to B2B. It's easy to go from B2B to B2C. To B to but um, but if we want to sell our application um, for B two B, we we should t talk with uh, B two C. So uh, uh, is, is this dilemma for us, our company, or it's yeah. it's not a dilemma. It's the fact that when you do a B two B, because you'd be a true B two B to C, the person that's using your app is the end consumer. So you do need to go do market research right? And ask that consumer. But the great thing is, is that there are other platforms and other companies like a ZocDoc of the world that have already done this and validated the product for you. Granted, there may be a little bit different, different spaces, but we've already validated in the market that we want to use apps to talk and get medical advice. We don't want to go, none of us want to fucking go to our doctor if we can help it, right? Or see any sort of medical professional. I don't. I stay as far, far away as far as I can. I will happily use some sort of app to get the questions I need or answers I need before having to go in and see a doctor or a medical That's professional. Right. So we've already validated that. We saw that through the pandemic, right? The pandemic was the rise of you know video calls for doctors. They had to, the medical field had to innovate and, and go online, even though they didn't want to. So we've already validated from a B2C play the need for this. So you don't have, you know, the dilemma is yes, you have to go talk to them, but at the same point, there are tons of other competitor research out there that you can bank off of and use this product market validation. That's going to allow you to take that to the B2B space. Hey, you know, we've talked to customers, we've produced research. We've also, you know, analyzed research from 15 other competitors. Here's what we do better than, than anything on the market and how we can help. Right. So you have all that information at your disposal. You just need to go find it. Uh, but but luckily, that market has already been validated for you over the last, you know, in 2020 and 2021. So a lot of it you don't have to do yourself.
Yeah, yeah, it's true. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, this is where this is where this book I talk about steal like an artist. So many other companies have already done that validation for you. You can go find it, um, and then use it. You know, internalize it and use it as your own. You don't need to go reinvent the wheel. So, um, figure out how to leverage all that data that's out there, uh, so that you don't have to go do it. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, great question though. This is, you know, it's tough, right? When you have B2B or B2C and you're looking at this, this is where it gets tough because a lot of times, you know, back to Alexander's question, you know, we have a vision of where we want to go, but we make money today. A lot of times we want to go B2B because it's a bigger market, but we have quicker success than B2C. So we try to go B2C first and we get a little bit of success and we hit a few things and then we stall out. And we're like, oh shit, we forgot to do anything B2B. Let's try to re-evaluate. And you have this really low where it's like, you need to go B2B. If you want to go B2C, you can, but you can't stop up here. If your goal is B2B and you know where that's the money is and that's where you want to play at eventually, you can never stop going after it, right? If B2C will hit you and make you some money, you can do it. But if it's at the expense of keeping you from doing B2B, don't do it. Right. So that's how, that's how you have to, like I said to Alexander, like you, if you're building something for a product or a company or make a way to make money and it hinders your future growth, like it's going to block you from going bigger to where you really want to go. Don't do it. No money is worth blocking you from the, like the company and the, like where you want to take the business. Cause otherwise you'll just run into more blockers that you never get over. So go after B2B, stay there, use other research. So you're tying, I'm just tying a loop to the both questions. Um, but uh, in the same time, uh, sometimes we think that B2C market, it's more, more, more big. There are more money in the B, B2C market. Uh, someone um, uh, have, uh, uh, have thought about that uh, B2C market is bigger than B2B. Uh, the B2C market looks, so I'm telling you from an app-based perspective, uh, I'm 99% sure on this. If you have other research, like show it to me and let's talk. But I'm 99% sure that in the medical space, B2C looks bigger, but is not. I don't, I, I won't, I won't promise you, I won't download an app just to speak to a doctor. But Unless, unless I have that option, right? If the doctor is like, hey, you don't need to come visit us. Here's the tool we use. So like my health or one medical, right? I only have these apps on my phone because I'm told to download them by my insurance company so that I can not have to go to the doctor's office. But I'm not out there searching for, oh, I'm going to go search for an app so that I don't have to talk to a doctor. Like that's not something that people are going to go search for. Now, if you have research that tells me otherwise, uh, cool, but I don't see that happening, but I downloaded just one medical yesterday. Cause I literally switched insurance. Like, Hey, do you want to skip ever going to a doctor's office again? Download our one medical app and have, you know, 24 hour access to doctors on call through our service. So you don't have to go to a doctor's office ever unless you want to. And I was like, yes, please download. Fuck that. Like game changer. So now I have that on my app, but I would never download that on purpose, right? So you have to think it's like, are, are consumers actually searching for an app like that or not? I don't, I don't think they are. I think the market looks bigger because there's more people, but unless you're selling, um, like truly selling a product to people, B2C is never the way to go. In fact, B2C is really hard on the app-based platform because 99% of app usage on the app store is dominated by the top 2% of apps. And there's like millions of apps in the app store. Let me say that again. 99% of people's app usage are on the top 2% apps in the app store. That means you're playing in a very, very murky water in the B2C app space. It's honestly quite terrible. Yeah. It's very competitive, com 
competitive area. Very much so. And if people aren't actively looking for it, it doesn't get ranked. So I would just think about that again, B2B company is saying, Hey, use this app to connect with us. So you don't have to do these things that becomes a win every day of the week and twice on Sunday. And people use it a lot. So that's why you're a B2B to C. The, the ultimate thing that you, your value prop becomes, we help you connect with your end consumer better. So you don't have to, right? Like that essentially is what we're, I think your value prop starts to become. Um, and you can take that to different people and say, Hey, you know, think about this. You can have, you can see 50 more people a day without having to have them in office faster, quicker, better, easier, it builds around your schedule, all those things. And that one person could be like, hell yeah, let's do it and push this out to their network. And that's how that B2B2C gets wins. And that's how you got a lot of people on your app using it uh, because B2B can do that. B2B has that power. So again, I'm going to tell you with 99% certainty that B2B is going to be a bigger, better play for you, unless you have tons of research that you want to share with me and have that conversation. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm not going to say that you should take my word as like God, but just from what I know of this space and having worked with a few companies in the medical space and working formally for a B2B benefits company, that's just what I know and what I believe. Yeah. Great question though. And thank and you. I, yeah. And like, that's, that's what this is all about, right? We're talking about kinetic analysis and here, here, you know, this is a great example for my guy here saying, Hey, like, you know, you're a pocket man, like, you know, we're kind of looking at this, we're still evaluating and we're looking at doing our competitive analysis and really understanding which side of the coin is better. That's exactly why this workshop is here for today. And that's exactly why you do all this stuff. Uh, you do a B2B and a B2C and it'll probably tell you that B2B is better. Like, but this is why we do these things. This is why we give you this competitive analysis and why the Q and A piece is so important. Why we want to get more conversation It's it's tough. It's tough to figure out where to go and what to do. Great question. And thanks for sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? We got a few more minutes. Well, if not, um, I've got oh. some availability tomorrow for one-to-ones. Um, I know we have... Uh, uh, you already uh, booked, guys already booked your slots, so... Yeah, let's say I've got um, Skillometer and uh, Gregory from Titanium Fitness tomorrow. There's still some times tomorrow morning. Um, if not, uh, or no, I think we put some extra time on the second, right? um for additional time so if you want to want to sit down one to one for half hour walk through your competitive landscape talk through any questions challenges you may have make sure you connect with me now and get get on my calendar happy to do it love to chat with you all um yeah my contact information as well uh linkedin is i'm very active on linkedin i know that in russia unless you have a vpn it's hard to get on so that my beacons link has my other ways to get in touch with me, feel free to, um, you can also just ask for my email from an out, um, but feel free to ask any questions uh, that you may have. And if you need anything else, like after the sessions, I'm around, just connect with me. Happy to uh, be an advocate, test the product, support in any way I can. All right, guys. Thank you, Appreciate, Rob. Thank you for yeah. your workshop. You bet. Appreciate uh, y'all letting me be here and getting to chat with y'all. And uh, those that stepped up and asked great questions, thank you. Because I'm sure others learned a lot from you asking questions. The last piece of advice that I don't want to walk away say is I know and I've worked with Startup since 2018. I've worked with a lot of, let's say, Eastern European founders. I know opening yourself up and asking questions and looking vulnerable is not a traditional thing. Uh, I know it's hard culturally, but especially in this program, in this program, be as vulnerable as possible. Take in, ask great questions because that is where, that is where you'll learn so much more. And there is not a single thing that you could have, especially me, that you could ask me that mistake that I haven't fucking made before.
the hard way. Um, if you really open yourself up to this and really let yourself be vulnerable and asking those tough questions, that's how you scale. Sometimes the biggest thing we do is we get in our own way because we're afraid to ask those questions because we might look stupid, et cetera. In this program, don't be afraid. I promise you, the people that are part of the startup ecosystem, it's probably the best fucking ecosystem I'm a part of globally. And I'm not kidding when I tell you that if you don't know who Alexi Guerin is and know what his network looks like, then you don't really, he has one of the most powerful networks. And if you want to get on his radar and you want to have big opportunity, you need to be vulnerable as fuck and make the mistakes and ask the hard questions and not be afraid to go do big things. So I'm telling you, if you want to make the most out of this program, having done this for so long and been a part of this ecosystem, be open, ask great questions, soak up every ounce of this program because it is amazing and the people you'll meet are great. Awesome. I'm going to step off my soapbox. You have an advocate in me for life now because you're part of this program and I love this ecosystem. So if I could ever be of service to you, please let me know. Thank you so much. And I've already sent the deck over, so you should have that on your Notion page. Already. Up. I already uploaded it to Notion, so yeah. Yes, yeah, so we move quicker you, on you bet. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for the time this morning or afternoon, your time. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Thanks for you, time. Thank Thank you, you very much. much. Cheers, y'all. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye, guys.